so the talk has two parts. Um, I know it's a very mixed audience. So the first part is sort of generally uh, an introduction to universal design for learning. And um, for some of you, you'll have, you already know this. You may know more about it than I do. Uh, and I apologize for that. But some people are uh, relatively new. So I wanted to just give that background. And uh, I'll probably go on too long with that because I get excited about it. Um, and then, though, I'd like to talk about my own teaching uh, and how I both succeed and fail in, uh, uh, in making UDL work in my own classrooms. OK. So uh, there are two major foundations for universal design for learning. And both of them, uh, at least indirectly, uh, come from what new technologies allow. First, new technologies have transformed our ability to do neuroscience, to understand the human brain. That's one of the things. And the second is new technologies uh, allow us to teach in different ways, that we don't have to um, use the traditional uh, lecture textbook format, um, as we've already heard today and, and yesterday. Uh, so those two things, advances in our understanding of human learning, and in particular, its diversity, and advances in our ability to use new technologies for teaching uh, are what goes together to make UDL in ways that I'll talk about. So I first want to talk about the neuroscience stuff. Um, and you've all seen images like this that are gorgeous, that allow us to see um, the nervous system, again, in ways that we never saw. And you probably, you may have heard this word in the press, uh, the connectome. And what uh, has become a central focus of neuroscience research of late is studying the connections. What's connected to what in the nervous system? And that's called the connectome. And it's meant to be an analog to the genome. And that is looking for the fundamental ways in which your nervous system is different than someone else's different. And it turns out to be that it's the connections that are made that are the critical difference. It's not how many neurons you have. There are other animals that even have more neurons than you do. It's the way in which our brains are connected that makes us special. And that differs amongst us as well, as we'll talk a little bit about. So the connectome is that, here's, this is a connectome, uh, human connectome. Uh, we can see them now and look at those differences and start to understand how are people different from one another. And that's the critical first thing is the more neuroscientists look at the connectome, the more they go, whoa, they're not exactly alike. They're in general alike. But they're at least as different as our fingerprints are. It's very easy if you could see someone's connectome to say, OK, that's not Billy's connectome. That's yours. Uh, so we're all different in the fundamental way in which our brains are connected, which is the most important thing. Today, because we do this in UDL, I'm going to talk about three parts of the connectome um, and just uh, go a little bit into what these three parts do. So the first part is the back part of your cortex. So this is the brain, this is the front, that's the back. All of this part really does one thing. The nervous system is a lot simpler than people um, sometimes make it out to be. So the back part does one thing, which is it takes information in from the outside world and makes sense of it, makes usable knowledge out of it. So uh, as you probably know, there's visual cortex here, somatosensory cortex here, auditory cortex here. All of these are the great parts of your brain that take information in from your senses. But all of this cortex is what you use to make sense of what you pick up in, with your ears, your eyes, your nose, your throat, so on. Next part of the brain, the front part of the brain, is very different. Looks different. It's connected different. Um, it's connected down, uh, ultimately connected to um, motor systems. So this part allows you to plan, execute, and monitor your actions on the environment. A key thing is that this is part of your brain that checks, did I do what I meant to do? It's a very goal-driven system, but this part of your brain <coughs> is about taking action uh, on the world. And then the third part, which I'll end with, which actually has got the, right now has the most heat, the most uh, study is going on, um, at least in the higher uh, parts of neuroscience, which are at the core of your brain, the center, um, which we can't see very well in this image, 
Um, the parts of the brain that allow you to evaluate and set priorities for attention and action. So these are the parts that you hear about in things like motivation or emotion and things like that. Not about taking information in, not about expressing it, but evaluating. Is this important to me? Is this something fearful? Is this something exciting? Uh, is this something boring? The middle parts of your nervous system do that for you. Uh, and we'll come back a little bit to these. So the first one, uh, recognition networks, we call them in the UDL framework. All of these parts, they allow you to recognize the outside world, make sense of it, and act smartly. So, uh, and I've done this, some of you may have seen videos and stuff, so I apologize, but I'm kind of a quick way to start. Um, I want to look at this part of recognition cortex, which is, some of you will recognize, oh, that's about where auditory cortex is. So this is part where ultimately the um, information, the little signals from your ear, finally come here to be analyzed, to be made sense of. And I'm going to introduce you to my wife, Ruth, who's here. We're actually in, going to enjoy Dublin once I get through this talk. Um, so that's Ruth. Uh, Ruth's the one on the right. Um, and <laughs> Ruth has got a different connectome than mine. She has what's called perfect pitch. Is there anyone here that has perfect pitch? It's a fairly rare, but it's not. Um, you need to uh, and select a better population. We should have at least one or two here. Um, and sometimes people are shy because they're afraid I'll ask them to sing. Uh, but anyway, perfect pitch, I think you probably know what it means. It means that any note that anybody plays, doesn't matter what instrument, if it beats at 440, Ruth knows it's an A and just says an A. And, um, and uh, it's not hard for her, she doesn't have to think about it. It's just like you recognizing the color red. It's not, you don't have to do much thinking about it. So for Ruth, anybody plays a note, and she says B flat, okay? And she's never wrong, et cetera, okay? So she has perfect pitch. And I'm not like Ruth uh, in that uh, I know high and low, and I've had a lot of musical, um, you know, took piano, a lot of trumpet, as we'll talk about later. Um, so I can recognize a pitch is higher than another one easily. And that's called relative pitch. Most of you have relative pitch. You, you, know, you know how to sing and stuff, and you know that this note's higher than that one, okay? But you don't know that it's a B flat. Uh, so what's the difference in our connectome that allows Ruth to do something quite different than I can do? Um, and uh, we now know, actually, the research has done, been fairly done recently, um, that Ruth's connectome does look indeed quite different, and mainly that she has this very thick highways of connectivity. This is auditory cortex here. And notice how much thicker hers is than a person with relative pitch. It's not that this person doesn't have any connections. They're just thin and like country roads. You know, you can't go, can't send a lot of information that way. Whereas Ruth can send a lot of information. Nice, big, thick roads. It's kind of a weak analogy. But anyway, you can see, wow, that's different. And notice that, in fact, it's really on one side. It happens to be on the left side, that you have this very unusually uh, over-connected uh, brain. Uh, so Ruth's neurology, her connectome, is that she has hyper-connected in uh, this, par this part of auditory cortex, and it's asymmetric, bigger on one side than the other. All of you are um, typically connected, and you're symmetric, same on both sides. Uh, and that's the way our connectomes look. So who has a disability? It's very different connectomes. And an argument I'm going to make, and I think uh, several speakers have made it in the last two days, um, is about context, uh, meaning everything. So I'm going to describe two contexts. So Ruth is a semi-professional singer, sings all the time in concert halls and so on, not as a soloist, but in choruses. She's, people recognize she's got great pitch, she should sing. Um, and uh, when she hears me sing, or we listen to something, she's kind of appalled at my disability. It's just like, you know, I have no idea what that note is. No, I don't know that they change from major to minor chords or anything. No, I don't know. And for Ruth, this is a, you know, something to be pitied. Um, and uh, was a, 
a part of our relationship early because Ruth, um, when we met, she knew that I had actually been a musician, or not professionally, but I played a lot of music. So she assumed I was going to be a good father of our children. And her, <laughs> her view of um, happy married life was from the movie, I think you've probably seen, The Sound of Music, <laughs> where she would marry somebody that looked a lot more handsome than I do, and we would generate six or eight children, and we'd be able to sing in six or eight part harmony uh, <laughs> while we were in a Volkswagen van, you know, crossing the Rockies. And so this is her view of what, you know, the future would look like. And so it was a great disappointment to her, <clears throat> too late in the relationship, when she discovered that I actually have terrible pitch, and worse, that I passed it on to our children. <laughs> so Ruth now has a whole family of people with disabilities from her, uh, from her take. And, uh, and it's all my fault. Um, but context is everything. So we go to a church together. And in our, it's an old New England church. Not old by your standards, but old by USA standards. And in the church, things are a little bit different. For one thing, I'm sitting next to Ruth. We've got the hymn book in front. And I'm not really singing perfectly on pitch, right? Just like you. I'm close by, but it's not great. And the person on Ruth's other side, they're not really singing perfectly on pitch either. They're somewhere nearby. And pretty much everybody's a little bit off, okay? But the worst thing is that the church's organ, which is very old, like old organs, has drifted away from A at 440. So when the, the organist presses the A key, it actually doesn't play A anymore. It plays a G, okay? And that's not so atypical. But it doesn't bother you, because you're like me. You're disabled, okay? And you go, hey, whatever he's playing is probably an A. I don't care. <laughs> But for Ruth, she sees this is supposed to be an A, and the organ's playing a G, and nobody's even singing quite right on G. So what does Ruth sing? Ruth kind of mumbles in church. What is she supposed to do? And I love the irony of the fact that every couple of years, our choir director asks if I would join the choir. <laughs> And they would, they would never think of asking Ruth. Isn't that fabulous? <laughs> so in our church, relative pitch is way, way better, okay? And Ruth looks disabled. And in fact, that's why I asked if there's anybody here who had perfect pitch. But people with perfect pitch will commonly describe it not only as their strength, but as their disability. Why? Because they hate it when people sing off pitch. They don't like it when the uh, radio plays the... Uh, tune and they play it too slow so it goes off pitch. They don't like it that rock stars can't sing on pitch. All of this is destructive so they find listening to music can often be problematic and singing with your husband who can't sing uh, is uh, highly problematic for them. Okay, so who has a disability is entirely contextual. Um, in this part of, this is the back part of your nervous system, there are other kinds of areas that are specialized. Within vision, and this is what's so neat about the nervous system, but people didn't know this till fairly recently. You have a specialized area for faces. You recognize faces in an area that's different than other parts of the, the visual world. Written words is right nearby. You recognize written words here, houses, big objects here, so on. You specialize, your cortex is specialized. But what's most important for our conversation today is that some people will have much bigger areas for any of these and much smaller for others. We're different even at that. It's not like we're visual or I never use the term visual learners or stuff like that. It's more complicated than that. So you can have a person, in fact, this guy who has prosopagnosia, which means face blindness. He's not blind. He can see everything, but he can't recognize people by their faces. It's just this part he has difficulty with. And he reads and talks and he knows what houses are and all that. But face is, is hard for him. And it's hard for you to even picture what it would be like that he doesn't recognize people by their faces. But by the way, he has friends. And you think about it for a second. Oh, in fact, I'll tell you the most surprising thing. Neither he nor his family knew he was face blind until he was 22 years old. 
This is a person who is face blind. He does not recognize anybody by their faces. And no one knew until he was 22. Think for a second, how could that happen? How do you get through school and nobody knows you're face blind? Okay. Well, the answer is he developed all sorts of other ways to tell people apart. The way they move, the way they dress, the way their voices sound, all of that. So he actually never noticed. And he found it surprising. And actually, he discovered it when he was watching uh, television with a friend. They were watching a soap opera. And he said, normally, geez, I wish they'd pull the camera back a little bit so we could see who's talking. Because you know what a soap opera is, right on their faces, because it's all about the emotion. So he said, he said, I wish they'd pull the camera back so we could see who's talking. And his friend goes, what? And he said, I can't tell who's talking. And the friend goes, what do you mean? And he says, well, like, we can't see what they're like. And then they have this enormous conversation where he finds out his friend's been telling people apart by their faces. For him. And he was like, really? You know, because for him, they're all the same. They all got one nose, two eyes, a mouth. You mean, like, what's the difference? Okay, so he's not specialized enough to tell people. He can tell you have a face, and it just looks like everybody else's face. Okay, so we differ. And uh, he's an example of someone. And you've seen lots of images like this. So dyslexic readers take in information very differently. They do a lot with their posterior cortex that doesn't, uh, sorry, a typical reader does a lot of things with posterior cortex. That's that word recognition area right there. And dyslexic readers aren't doing it that way, using different parts of their brain. Very different. Um, one of my favorite recent studies was looking at children with autism and finding out that um, children with autism were hyper-connected um, in large parts of their cortex. So that same thing, remember, that Ruth had, the hyper-connected auditory cortex? Kids with autism are hyper-connected all sorts of places. Now, that's a really, the reason I wanted to get here was that's a different view of autism than thinking, as many do, that they have a hole in their head or they've had some terrible thing go wrong or whatever. Seeing them as hyper-connected, like Ruth's auditory cortex, means they're going to be quite disabled at some things and quite strongly abled at others, just like Ruth's perfect pitch and her inability to sing in church. So kids with autism are hyper-connected in the same way that Ruth is, but with most of their senses. Isn't that interesting? So there's some downsides to that and some upsides. Upsides is their fabulous memories, for example. Much better than yours. Incredibly good with perceptual tasks. Better than you. Um, so what does this mean for all of us? Uh, first approximation of an answer. We tend to use fixed, uniform learning technologies, things like a book. And we have highly varied learners. They're not coming to it with the same brain at all. And that's a problem. But the problem is we've always identified it as this is the problem. The kid's the problem. And we have, I used to be a neuropsychologist, um, and this is the kind of books you read, neuropsychological evaluation of the child. What's wrong with this child? There's something really wrong. Because they don't have a good match between the media we use and the brains they're using. Um, but the children are blamed, they're the problem, You're, you've got a disability. New media um, are changing these equations, and that's why new media are part of doing UDL. Not, I should say, a, a required part. There are fabulous teachers who do not use any technology who are doing great UDL. We'll probably get a chance to talk about that. But, um, it allows, like a, any other great tool like jet engines, it allows us to do things we couldn't do before. So what does it change? And I'll do this quickly. Um, the new media are a foundation for great flexibility. So here's the, I'm um, highlighting text um, that's stored in a hard drive or uh, in your cell phone or on your car, or whatever. Um, and it's then displayed in some device. Um, but the great thing is we can take the same text and display it in whole, all kinds of different ways, different colors, different sizes, fonts, all of that stuff you know. Um, but some of you are as old as me, and you remember when you couldn't do that. You, you know, you couldn't change the size of your text easily. Now you can. You can change the language. Google does this, of course, fabulously. Um, but we can also display in different sense modalities. So we can take that same text and say, yes, we can do it visually, but we could also do it haptically. Give it to me in refreshable Braille so I can feel it. Um, so. Uh, we now have multiple modalities, but the same text, 
uh, shown in different ways. We can also now, as everything now, this used to be special, now everything that's text in your computer can be spoken, in, spoken aloud. Great, we have an all, a new uh, channel of information from that same text. And there's cool things like uh, this is a um, virtual signer. So you can take that text and run it through the virtual signer and he signs it. So you can change same text, but now flexible in how it's displayed. And that's what we look at with Universal Design for Learning. And just to end this little segment, um, I, I love this. This is, uh, did, did the show Glee make it to Ireland? Okay, some of you know. Some of you don't know, and that means you're just out of it, so don't admit it. Uh, so Glee is, uh, was a really, really popular show in the U.S. Uh, treats disability better than almost any other show, and better treats disability better than American schools do, to be honest. So what's, what is cool about Glee is their website has a karaoke part, and uh, what happens is, you, you know, the song's been sung or whatever, and it says, do you want to sing it? And you say, of course, yes, and then you record it. And then the magic happens. There's a little button that says, do you want pitch correction? <laughs> so you can sing with great expression, sing with, you know, emotion, you know, like loud and everything, because you know that little button is going to take care of the ugly part. Like, <laughs> who cares? And so I'm able to go into that, do my little singing, press pitch correction, and Ruth thinks I'm great. Isn't it? <laughs> uh, okay. Um, this kind of capacity has changed policy, and uh, it was great to hear, uh, in some ways, Norway, I think, is ahead of us, but um, uh, changing the landscape from practice to policy. Um, there's a, a law that was passed in the U.S. that's really kind of neat, the National Instructional Materials Accessibility Standard, NIMAS, which says, you know what, because we can do this, we must. We must change the way in which textbooks are delivered to students. They must have this flexibility. And NIMA specifies how that's done. There's also, uh, it, it basically says, in fact, it's true now. Every textbook in the US that's published is now published in a NIMAS version, which is a complete digital version so that it can be quickly and easily put out as Braille, put out as a talking book, put out as a large print book, all of that can happen flexibly from one source file. That's the NIMA source file. Um, public policy. Um, <clears throat> the, um, a fairly recent, the, the most recent Higher Education Act in the US actually defined universal design for learning. It was cool. We learned that the US Congress is a lot like uh, middle school students. You, say, you don't say junior high here, do you? But anyway, middle school students, um, in that they copied stuff off our website and put it into the federal legislation, and, but they changed words and stuff, you know, so it wouldn't look like it was copied. And we thought, well, this is cool. <laughs> yeah. But anyway, so, but we like their, their wording was kind of better than ours. So now we've, we're kind of taking up their words. So here's what they say universal design for learning is. Provides flexibility, keyword, in the ways information is presented. Da, da, da. And they'll talk about three things that we're going to talk about today. In the way students respond or demonstrate what they know, and in the way students are engaged. Cool. Three principles. And reduces barriers in instruction. Appropriate accommodation, sports and challenges, blah, blah. Um, maintains high achievement expectations for all students. Not low level access, high levels of achievement expectations, including students with disabilities and students who are limited. I like it. It doesn't say for kids with disabilities. It said including kids with disabilities, uh, everybody. And these laws have recently, and it's not true at every school or anything in the US, but there's a change that's happening that's palpable, which is this one. The NIMAS is described as addressing the national need to increase the availability and timely delivery of print instructional materials, textbooks, in accessible formats to blind or other students with print disabilities in elementary and secondary schools. This is a sea change for me, and it's a universal design change. Instead of saying the student is learning disabled or intellectually disabled or something like that, Saying that they are print disabled starts to co-locate the problem. That is, you need to look at 
there's a bad relationship, and the talk earlier about relationships, there's a bad relationship between this kid and their instructional materials. If you start off with the view that it's the kid's problem and we've got to fix the kid, then you have this really corrosive system. If you start off by thinking, hmm, maybe print is not good enough, maybe print is what has the disability, then you start to get to good solutions. So in the US, it started to happen here, and now kids can go to a clinic and be diagnosed with a print disability, which, by the way, is incredibly more affirming because it says, you know what, print's not a good medium for you, but there are other media, and uh, it takes away that problem of you are broken and uh, you can't make it. So I, I love it when the, this, these books will be changed to neuropsychological evaluation of the curriculum. What are the disabilities in the curriculum? And I, if I want to stir up parent audiences, I talk about what kind of disabilities does your school have? And at first they go, what? And then someone will say, you know, my school's sort of autistic now that you mention it. <laughs> and um, my school's, it's dyslexic now, you know, and, and then they all of a sudden you start realizing, ah, the curriculum, the ways in which we teach are also sources of disabilities. I love this title. This is a UK article. Is English a dyslexic language? Is part of that change? Hey, we got to think about this. <laughs> Labeling the kids as dyslexic, but hey, that English. Other languages, a lot fewer kids have problems learning to read than English. English has disabilities. It's not a great written language. Uh, that was heresy, wasn't it? I know. OK. Um, anyway, the goal, though, isn't to meet these requirements. It's to do better learning. And uh, so I just want to give an example just for fun. Uh, this is, um, I'm just, I, I want to make sure I get enough time at the end, so I'm not going to do my elaborate setup, but you can all picture, if I played a piece of music to you and I said, we're going to do a comprehension test on it, I'm going to play a little bit and then I'm going to ask you some hard questions about it, okay? And you'd, you'd all go, ooh, okay, because you'd know you're not probably going to do very well at it um, <clears throat> if I just play the music. And I'm going to skip that for a moment. Um, if for some of you, if I give another representation of it, I give the graphical representation of it, you say, oh, okay, I see what's going on here because you have uh, good uh, music reading skills. For lots of you in the audience, that wouldn't help either, either being immediately listening to it or looking at the score. Neither of those would give you a good uh, entry vehicle to what this piece is really doing. So I just wanted to show you, there's this guy that does these now. These are very, becoming very popular, which I think is cool. So let's look at uh, Bach um, in a multiple representations as we'll talk about them. Whoop, I'm sorry. Don't know how to use my slideshows. Um, I know you want me to keep playing and stop talking. Um, <laughs> it gets actually better. I'm not going to take the time to do it here, but in the fugue of this, it's glorious because he does a fabulous job of highlighting the theme, and you see the theme keep popping up everywhere in ways that you would never hear it. And, um, but you can see it easily because of the way he does this beautifully graphically, and he 
makes this theme stand out, which in the UDL guidelines called highlighting critical features. You say, let me highlight the theme for you because maybe you're not an expert listener yet. And so we can highlight it. And you see the theme and you go, wow. And then you see, Buck. Well, I don't even want to tell you that. Uh, so I'm showing this to a friend who's a musical scholar with his daughter. And I, or rather, I wanted to show it. And I said, I've got this fabulous visualization of Bach's blah, blah, blah. And he said, oh, yeah, I know. I teach that. Um, I've played it uh, you know, hundreds of times. And I said, but I think it shows really cool things about it. He says, look, I know that piece. <laughs> and, uh, and, his, and his daughter was a teenager, luckily. And she says, Dad, why don't you just look at it? OK, so we go, all right, all right. So we put it up. And it, again, it's much richer when we get later in the thing. But anyway. So at first, he's kind of desultory and kind of like, like David's going to teach me about music. But he gets more and more glued into this. And at the end, he goes, wow. You know, I never knew what Bach was doing in that middle passage. Because in fact, he inverts the theme and stretches it out. And it's very hard to see it in the score. It's very hard to hear it. But then he realized, oh my god, Bach is smarter even than we knew. So he learned something. The reason I wanted to highlight that was because people think of UDL as something you do, and that got mentioned earlier, for remedial students, students that are in trouble, struggling. Um, and in fact, you, you do UDL so that in fact there's enough purchase in here that music scholar needs to be able to learn something new too. And what I loved about it was that he did. A new representation of the Bach gave him something to learn. Fabulous. Um, and UDL, at its best, is doing that. We call those multiple representations. Presenting information in new ways, in multiple ways at the same time, gives more people a chance, not just remedial students, but everybody a chance to learn better. OK, I'm going to skip uh, over here. So uh, Universal Design for Learning has three main principles. Provide multiple means of representation. I've just talked about that. Representing information in multiple ways. Um, makes more kids be successful, whether you have disability or not. And um, there are two more, and I'm going to be much briefer on them. Uh, hopefully you have the idea. Um, and as I said, the front part of your brain, it's about expression. And people are really different there. And uh, I, just because I'm in the UK, I wanted to, uh, how many people know who Tim Berners-Lee is? Raise your hand if you know who Tim Berners-Lee is. OK, lots of people don't. So Tim Berners-Lee is the guy who wrote the World Wide Web. And he's, a, uh, he's been knighted, and he you know, has dinner with the queen and stuff like that. This is an um, a incredible guy. Um, and uh, what's interesting, though, is Tim is quite disabled. He has what's called executive function disability, though his school didn't tell him that. He just knew that school really was not good for him. Um, and you probably know the story that he invented the World Wide Web, not because he had a job to do that. He wasn't even hired to do anything like that. He was a physicist at CERN. And he wanted, because he's very ADHD, is what the people would call him. And by the way, he's as ADHD as anyone you'll ever meet. Um, he um, couldn't stand it that you had to, once you did your Somebody did some findings, and they wouldn't be able to get them for a year in a journal. It was like, can you imagine for an impulse disordered person? We did this fabulous experiment. We found the boson, or whatever that is. And you'll see it in a year. You know, <laughs> Tim was like crazy. No, I, I got to see it now. So he invented the URL. What's a URL? A universal resource locator. So we could find everybody's paper immediately, right now, just like an ADHD person would like it. Notice that a person who didn't have ADHD would never have done that. They would have said, we need to make a library. We need to have card catalogs and all this stuff. <laughs> and Tim would go, oh my god, I can't go to the library. That takes a heck of a long time. And looking through cards, no, 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 I want to find it right now. Give me every, everything in the world's going to have its own universal resource locator. Anybody would have said, that's crazy, except other ADHD people who would have said, wow, that sounds great. Okay. <laughs> uh, so Tim invented the World Wide Web. Now, 
I like to argue he invented the World Wide Web because nobody drugged him. They, you know, they, they, they didn't give him these drugs to get that rid of that. And so he kept being impulsive and uh, uh, creative in the ways that ADHD people can be, looking for a better solution in the outside world rather than drugging himself. I also have to say, just want to make sure, um, what I like about it, this is again a context argument, is that, isn't it true, he's made all of you more ADHD than you were before? <laughs> Remember when you could sit and read a whole book and you were quiet and everything, you know, and now you're on the web and you are so distractible, it's unbelievable. That's, that's the legacy of Tim Berners-Lee. He said, <laughs> I want to get to everything right away. So you have problems. You have a new disability, which is you can't concentrate on the web. And Tim's really happy. Okay. Um, and uh, so there are things you can do. There's uh, even web control things. This one I love, self-control. Uh, you know how you're, you're distracted like that? You don't know what to do? Uh, there's an app for that, of course. Like there's an app for everything. And the app's called self-control. And what it is is you say, uh, I want to get this paper done, and I'm not, I don't want to you know, get distracted by Facebook and Instagram and Twitter and all that for a half an hour, let's say. I'm going to get my work done. So you punch in half an hour, and it, those sites can't get to you. Now, the great thing is you can't override it because you know you are smart people, and you, the minute, you know, 10 minutes into you, you go, I just got to check Facebook for a second. And it says, no, no, you said half an hour. <laughs> Oh, my God. So I, I know that some people go to another computer. I understand. <laughs> but anyway, uh, self-control. Uh, so um, there are things we can do uh, that provide um, multiple means of action and expression, acting on the world that allow uh, kids and adults and Tim Berners-Lee to express themselves in ways that show how smart they are rather than uh, how disabled they are. Um, and uh, last of these three things, and I'm going to uh, probably try to really do this quickly, um, but it's the most important one, is the central part of your nervous system uh, is the part, again, that sets uh, priorities, uh, that evaluates for you. And you experience it as emotions. Emotions are a separation of values you have, some of which are born in, uh, like you feel emotion when you're uh, confronted by a lion, okay? And what does emotions do? They optimize according to core values. One of core value is you stay alive, okay? Your nervous system is designed to keep you alive till you at least procreate. And it has core values to say, avoid things that would kill you. And uh, when you see a lion, your core values are challenged. It's like, oh my God, if I don't do something... I'm not going to be alive soon. Uh, so it optimizes what you seek, attend to, remember, predict, achieve. You are focused. And that's what emotions do for you. It says, okay, there's a lot of things you, you could be thinking about your future. You could be thinking about singing. You could be thinking about the USA. You could be thinking about anything. Right now, you're not going to do that. You're going to think about that lion and only that lion. And emotions are going to help you get directed and make sure that that's the only thing you're paying attention to. Okay. Um, and... Uh, the, the stu are the students still here? They're, oh, they're out doing their work. There was a thing that came up that, uh, from that talk uh, this morning that I wanted to highlight. The engagement thing. How do we motivate students? And I want to argue that it is incredibly uh, personal uh, like the other things I've talked, you're very different in what actually motivates and engages you, each of us. And teachers, to be good teachers, have to be incredibly good at understanding these differences. So um, this is Benjamin Bloom, who I don't know if he's big here, but in the USA, he's big a long time ago. He's an old book. Um, did research on what made students come out to be extraordinarily successful, um, top opera singer, top mathematician, top uh, athlete, dancer, musician. How did they get there? And he talked about, you know what? It's all affect. And he, he talked about the other things first, but he said, finally comes down to affect. 
And he said that mostly you get there by having three different kinds of teachers. And this happened to me. This is me in college. I was a trumpet player. And uh, I'm just going to describe briefly my uh, learning how to be a trumpet player. The first teacher, which Bloom talks about, is all about providing an emotional foundation for me to like music and to feel like I can play music. And I remember my first teacher wasn't even a trumpet teacher. It was a piano teacher because I lived in a small town and there wasn't any trumpet teachers. And uh, I would bring a plastic trumpet that my mother got me. My mother was an excellent teacher. And I said, I want to play the trumpet. She said, OK, great. And the reality, no trumpet teachers in town and we don't have a trumpet. She went to a toy store, got a thing that looked like a trumpet with, you know, was not a real trumpet even. And she said, why don't you take this to your music lesson? And can you imagine the teacher? In I come with this plastic thing, and she's trying to teach me, you know, how to play Bach on the piano, and I want to play this plastic thing. The great thing is, she said, David, we're going to make music. I, you know, I don't remember it at all exactly, but she got me to like music and play, even with this plastic trumpet, and I wouldn't give it up, and so finally my parents got me a real trumpet, and I gave up the piano and became, uh, played trumpet. Um, then um, I began to have real lessons by people who knew how to play trumpet and got to be quite good. Uh, because why? I cared about the trumpet more than anything else. I practiced a lot, blah, 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 got to be a good trumpet player. Um, and that second teacher, the teachers I would have then, were all about technique. I've got to do scales and I've got to practice and I've got to do things over and they, you know, how do they motivate me to do that? And you all know this. They said, David, how would you like to be in a band? A band? How cool. Uniforms, everything. Girls. Okay. <laughs> so what is that? It's saying, hmm, there's social things. There's things we can do. I can give little stickers on your practice sheets. I can motivate you to sustain practice. But that's very different than that first teacher. But then came a pivotal incident. Um, I moved to a big school, Miami, Florida, where the bands are big, and I was the best trumpet player in our school. And we went to a contest, and our band uh, did not win it. I don't know if we came in last, but we didn't do well. And the judge came out, and he said, his critique, very first critique, he said, the solo trumpet player does not play musically. And I'm like, that was me. So you can imagine in high school, all of your peers, 120 people, and the judge is saying, you guys lost because of that David Rose guy. <laughs> you know, it's just like devastating. And I didn't even know, I didn't know what to do. I'd practice and everything. And my band teacher was good. And he said, David, let's go talk to the judge after because he, he realized I was crushed. And so he, we go up to the judge and, and says, what? Anyway, the judge says, he needs a new trumpet teacher. Now, my trumpet teacher was my band leader. I'm like, this is putting him down, too. And I'm like, what kind of teacher do I need? So they find a new teacher. I have to go a few towns over. And I'm going to describe exactly my first interaction with this new teacher. This is my third teacher. Not about foundational. Music is great. You're going to be great. Second teacher, how can we motivate you to sustain effort? Third teacher is this one. I, he says, OK, play me something. So I play my best piece. And he says, literally, every word of this is accurate. He says, do you play anything well? <laughs> now, this is the exact opposite of that first teacher. I'm on a plastic trumpet. There's nothing going on. And she's saying, that's beautiful, David. <laughs> and this guy, on my best piece after you know eight years of practice, do you play anything well? OK. What Bloom learned was to get to the highest level of talent you needed what he calls a tyrant. Not at the beginning, not even at the middle. But once you have good technique and all of that, then you need somebody who was more driven by the music than by you to say, that doesn't sound like Mozart. It's not musical. And anyway, that guy turned me into an actually good trumpet player. But it was, I don't remember him ever saying to me once, David, that was really good. I don't think he ever did it. I think he would say, the best he would say was, all right, let's move on. <laughs> and you've all heard these stories ballet dancers talk about their teachers that way they're ruthless and there's some movie out right now I can't remember the name of it that's exactly about this um, some people 
And I can tell, no, okay. Um, so we have to design our teaching environments emotionally, not just cognitively, not just how do we represent information, not how do we change what, how do we provide alternatives for expression, but different kids in our classrooms need very different emotional connections, the relatedness that was talked about. And I wanted to end this section, and I've probably gone on too long, by saying that at its heart, and it goes with exactly the talk just before this one, Teaching is at its most core, just like it is core in the nervous system, teaching is emotional work. It was described as relational work. It's emotional work that getting kids to want to learn, getting kids to feel good about themselves as learners, all of those things are what makes a good teacher. And think of any movie you've seen about teaching that is a motivation, that is, a, you know, any of the popular movies, Goodwill Hunting or, uh, you know, I don't know what ones are popular here. They're not about a great new way to do long division. They're about how did that person motivate those kids? And that's what the emotional work of teaching is. So what we think of when we do UDL is we've got to make sure there's enough representations so people can have some success. Got to make sure there's enough ways to express yourself so we're not limiting uh, kids to uh, only things they're not good at and so on. Um, but then we still have to do the hard work, which is how do we emotionally get kids ready eager, uh, enthusiastic to learn. Um, and uh, that's the fun part. And there's things you can do, and I'm going to skip these for the moment, but it turns out one of the things you can most do is help kids recenter their view of where do they come from. There's enormous amounts of studies that says, what's the thing you can do that would best make a kid's score go up on a test, a standardized test? You know what the best thing you can do is? Ask them to tell you a five or ten minute story about their family and what's good about their family for them. That raises scores by 40, 40 points. Nothing about the content, but just about what, who are you and what's strong about your family. That changed scores. And uh, you can also give people feedback that is motivational feedback rather than, oh, you're smart, which isn't, doesn't turn out to be motivational. Um, I want to show you, this is a youngster Matthew has a uh, severe, severe motor disability and uh, can only move uh, his chin and a little bit of his face, um, can't um, walk, talk, point, do anything like that. His neck is held up by a brace. This is what's called locked-in syndrome. And he came to us as a, um, a child which was assumed to be profoundly retarded and uh, the schools were going to send him to an institutional school. And his mother just didn't believe it. Anyway, so we were new at this. And this is Ann Meyer, the co-founder of CAST. And we have just made a switch to put under Matthew's chin so he can, he can move the switch. Remember, he has never, uh, never spoken a word in his life. He can't even point at things. So people had no idea whether he was, is there anything in there was the question. So we were getting this. And we didn't know what we were doing. So we decided maybe Morse code. Maybe we can teach him to click. And that will work. So you're going to see this. We, the reason I'm showing it is we just discovered this in our archive on somebody's computer. This is Ann Meyer for the very first time trying to teach this little guy, who can only move his chin, to do Morse code. But watch this. Very good. OK, wait a minute. Wait a minute. Good. Now long. Short. Long. OK, let's try again. Then long. Good. Good. Matt. You know what happened though? There was too long a pause. Oh. Matthew, this is hard work and you are doing great. You did it. You did it. That was it. That, that's that right. That was the magic thing. I think yes, the yarn. Okay, you go. Matt, hold it. Hey, you're, you're ahead of me. How can you get ahead of me? <laughs> Look at you. <laughs> <laughs> you did it. Matthew. And if I can just get switch to stay here, we'll be all set. Oh, I love it. I love it. Because you see the emotional work going on. You notice two things happen. That's the biggest smile anybody ever seen on him in his entire life, including his mother, saying that. But did you notice that Anne cries? That they're in an emotional relationship at that moment, fundamentally. It's really fabulous. I'm, I didn't even know we had that. Okay. So that's UDL. Okay, um, providing multiple means of engagement. You can't engage everybody the same way, uh, et cetera. So I want to just spend the, the remaining time I have just talking about, well, what do I do in my own teaching? And 
Uh, some of it really is terrible, just like any of you do when you teach. And, uh, but I've learned a few things that uh, um, I try to do better at. Um, first, lectures like this. Um, I used to do, I, have a, I teach three hours at a time. Uh, I do give them a break. But anyway, long lectures, blah, blah, blah. Um, and how do I make lectures more accessible? Uh, this is something you can all do, and it works great, and it's quick. Um, you know, at, at your universities, you may have uh, people who are paid note takers. I don't know if you do in the US. It's common. You have someone take notes and put them up or share them with students with disabilities. Actually, I find that really awkward. doesn't work well, because the problem is the note taker is typically not a person taking the class. They don't have, of course, the same background knowledge as the kid that they're taking notes for. So the notes are usually useless. Um, oh, there's probably professional note takers here. <laughs> Once in a while, they're useless uh, for the actual learner. Um, so uh, one of the things that I've learned to do is to just ask, in a group like this, I would say, OK, every week, five of you are going to take notes. The key thing is I say five of you, not one. Five of you are going to take notes as part of your participation in class. You take notes, and you put them up on the web. So I just want to show you what happens if you say, take notes any way you want. This will be a nice UDL summary. Look what happens. So this is what everybody thinks is going to happen. Somebody who takes these gorgeous linear notes that their high school English teacher taught them. OK, here's, this is pretty much the same lecture you're going to see, but different note takers. So this is one, a nice outline. This one, person says, hey, I can use images. I like images. So he puts images in, OK? And it's uh, you know, richer and uh, et cetera. This person says, I don't like all that text anyway. So she begins largely and does the whole lecture in just uh, two pages of drawings. Oh, I didn't, I, I didn't keep them all. Anyway, mostly drawings instead of text. OK, same lecture. And actually, I, actually, once students see this one, they all go, you mean we can take notes with pictures? And they start changing. The whole, there's a contagion. People say, well, we can take notes. We don't have to take them like that. We can take notes like that. We can take notes like that, so on. They start getting more. And then this guy comes in. Notice how it starts. He says, uh, hi, my name is Chris. In case you missed it or simply want to relive it, here's what happened on Tuesday night. That's him. So he says, hey, the critical thing isn't David Rose. It's me. <laughs> <laughs> and so he starts telling the story of him being in class. And so it's much more like a letter from camp. And he talks about, you know. Katie, Katie asked me for gum. She's out of luck. It's 7.05. Got to going. He's doing this. But eventually, he gets to the actual lecture. And he does a, so there's me and my real teaching. And that's his bottle of ginger ale. Um, but it's pretty good notes. And they're more interesting than uh, class outline. Then this guy did the most amazing thing. He took the whole lecture and went to the a cartoon repository and got a cartoon for every single point. Now, I use that next year. It's fabulous. Have your students, you know, never work harder than your students, that kind of, you know, having my students take notes, they are adding stuff. I've got new images, I've got cartoons for my main points. So next year, it's a lot easier. Okay. And it's cheaper um, than paying someone to do it. Uh, textbooks. Um, uh, I think you all, and probably you have disability services in your universities that will render uh, books into digital form. Increasingly, that will be automatic. They'll all be in digital form because of laws like NIMAS that will just say, you have to do it. Um, so here's a, our newest book, and I, I hope some of you will look at it, uh, Ann Meyer, that woman well, you just saw. Ann Meyer is the first author, uh, Universe is Time for the. But what's different about this book is that it is uh, available in like four different versions. Uh, again, that flexibility. One uh, is a standard print you get on Amazon like any book, OK? Um, a, another one is a rich uh, web book that is full of videos, for example. In fact, we tried to make the book so you could do the whole book by watching videos with just text as accompaniment. It doesn't work really quite as well. It, it was just too expensive to make that many videos. But there are videos everywhere and images everywhere, and the images are described for people who are blind, and the videos are captioned for people who are deaf, and all of that happens. So it's a rich multimedia thing. So it's much, actually much better than the print one in terms of the media that are available uh, for you to use it. And then there are several other versions that make uh, various accessibility things. But what's interesting is I've now, th this book's just been out for a year, but 
This year I asked students what, what they had to read it. What did you do? And you know what's interesting is there was great diversity. Uh, some people only wanted the print. They didn't want to ever, you know, they hate being online like some of you. So they did the print. Some people never considered, said they didn't even think about buying a print book. The digital one's free, by the way. Um, they said, you know, hey, I read on the web everything. I've got my, you know, iPad. Um, but a very significant minority, I would say 40 to 45 percent, bought the print version and used this one, the, the digital version, and would do, depended on their mood or what they were doing. Did they want to take notes? Did they want to listen to it? Because, of course, it all talks itself aloud. You know, there's sort of many different things. But sometimes you're at the beach. You don't want to bring your computer. So they brought the print version. So actually, 40 to 45 percent had two or three versions of the same book, and they used it as they wished. Isn't that cool? That's the kind of flexibility that we can do. Um, so class, um, what do I do in class? I've sharply reduced lectures. Some of you are already bored and you're thinking, oh my god, he's gone on too long. I'm near the end. Uh, and a lot of my students are like that. You know, like, oh my god, three hours of this? How could I possibly, you know, ADHD is just like impossible. Um, and English, I have a lot of uh, foreign students. All that English, that's a problem. So uh, anyway, here's how class goes now. I give a relatively short lecture, more like 45 minutes now, um, sometimes even just a half an hour, standard lecture. And then we go into design teams uh, where we're making something. Every, every single week now, we make something. And it might be just like a picture description, so people can get a sense of how do you make a picture universally designed. It might be as small a task as that, or uh, something uh, larger like, how would you design a summer camp so that everybody would be welcome, for example. But anyway, design teams that meet regularly. And that is about an hour. And then the last hour are what we call advanced consulting groups. And they're specialized, where you're learning a specific thing that you want to bring back to your design group. And they're uh, where students can, in fact, differentiate and say, one of these is like a research group. One of these is a multimedia design, multimedia uh, group. Uh, one of them is a, a teacher group. But where that they have different takes, different things they're studying, and they get to be experts at it, and they bring it back to their teams. Anyway, so that seems to be working nicely that some people really like lectures. They got to Harvard because they were good at sitting in lectures. And if I don't do any lectures, they hate it. They don't feel like their $35,000 is worth it. Um, so we do some lecture, and it provides groundwork. But then there's active learning, and then there's sort of advanced learning. But everybody's in an advanced group, but not the same one. If you have a big, good research background in um, uh, neuroscience, there's a group for you. So they, over the course, we all do some things together, we do some things in small groups, and we differentiate into special sort of, everybody's got to get to advanced. Um, last thing, uh, oh, yep, I'm at the end here. Um, in the course, how do I do assessment? What's the end? Um, they have a major project, but, um, and this is, a, this is an example. They make a, um, they have to make a new uh, piece of, uh, uh, it's saying it's a piece is probably not right. They have to do an instructional thing and make it. Um, it could be something for a museum. It could be something for a classroom. So this is a website that these people made that was really fabulous. But it has four things. And this turned out to be the key thing. Because you know what happens in college is everybody writes a paper or everybody takes an exam. And that's the problem, sort of saying there's one, after we do all of this, you all got to pass the exam or you all got to write a paper. So what this does is says, actually, there's four parts of this project. One is you've got to make a working prototype. And that gives kids who are good with technology something to, I can fuss with digital bits. Second part, you must justify your project with research. So people who are really good at research papers or who want to get better at doing a research paper can do that. A third part is an implementation plan. How is this going to work in a real classroom or a real museum? Who's going to do what? And how are you going to train them? So they have to have an implementation plan that goes with it. And lastly, this turned out to be really spooky good. 
They have to have a marketing, they have to have a marketing piece to tell people why is this a great product? Why should you have it in your classroom? Or why should this particular design of a camp be the right thing? So they have to sell it. What selling it does is it glues them into what is the most important thing to say about what we did. And it really focuses everybody. So wait a minute, there's four things that have to go in. You can see up here, they've got those four things. What I like about it is that it does allow people to differentiate. And the students have liked it. And again, I'm, it isn't necessarily that you do the thing you're best at, but you do the thing you want to learn more about doing. And people get that choice. And they work together, of course. They're not separate. But they work together as a team. But that seems to work a lot better, whereas working together and making one thing, like a single paper, doesn't work well. And you've all been in bad teams where four people are working on a paper. It always ends up that one person does 70% of the work, and the rest are kind of either angry or confused. And this kind of differentiating is a, is a much more universal design for learning quote. And I uh, just want to say, where can you go to if you want to learn more about all sort of stuff like this? Um, this is CAST, where I'm from. But this is the key one. We have a new site, UDL on campus, which is entirely devoted to post-secondary. Um, it's brand new, so don't expect it to have as much as the full CAST site does. But um, the Gates Foundation has funded us to uh, really talk about UDL on campus. So you just type in UDL on campus on, in Google and you'll come to it. But it's, it's fairly new, it's just growing, and hopefully, and I've been told to tell you this, that you'll provide stuff that can be shared uh, via UDL on campus. We want you to be, some of you are doing better things than we are, we hope you'll contribute them. And a uh, new book just came out last week, wanted to highlight for you. Um, uh, this is Tom Hare, uh, author of the book. Uh, a student with disabilities uh, that actually took my class. It was fabulous to have him. Um, how did you get here? Students with disabilities and their journeys to Harvard. It's definitely an elitist book, but it's about, okay, students with disabilities who succeeded all the way through and got to an elite uh, college, how did they do it? They're just personal stories. They're really cool. And I got to write a foreword for it. So you can read my foreword. Actually, I like my foreword. Please read my foreword. I like it. Um, there's other books uh, you can see, but I'm out of time. Anyway, thank you so much for your uh, attention. David, thank you very much for a truly inspirational lecture. Uh, I know we're running a little bit behind time, but I think we've all enjoyed this so much that if, if David's willing, perhaps we could spend five more minutes with questions, if that's okay. It's okay with me. Okay, can... So can we... The first one. Thank you, David, very much for your presentation. Thank you very, very much. Uh, in our country, in Holland, we're trying to do a bit like you can do about uh, telling the good news about UDL. But right at the moment, after the presentation, we always get a question. Okay, can you show me some scientific, scientific, um, true, uh, the, how do you say, uh, conf uh, evidence that what you're all saying is uh, true? Can you, if, what do you, how do you respond on such a remark? Right. So the question is about well, what's the evidence that this works, okay? And um, there's a lot of research in, under the guidelines, each guideline will have a ton of research about why, why we say this works. So if you go there, it's really boring and it's being revised um, so that you can find it. But it really just says, um, why should you provide um, uh, captions? It, actually, captions has very little. This is the odd part. The more obvious it is that they would be beneficial, the less research there is. And it's maybe that's OK, but still, people want to know, does it really pay off to do captions? And the answer is there's actually all, very few studies that go anything past, do you like having captions if you're deaf? And the answer is yes. But do you do better? in the university setting if all your cap videos are captioned is something that there's very little information on. But that when you sort of go, well, I get it, that if you can't actually pick up the information in the video, that can't be good. 
So some of it is thin on research. Some of it's a lot, like highlighting critical features as a matter of uh, educational practice. There's hundreds of research articles. So we'll give the, here's the key research, and you can find them there. So there's that kind of thing. But I think your question is, the more interesting question is, if you more universally design your whole campus, for example, or your whole school district, what happens? Is there general improvement in overall competencies? Do our kids, kids and the university better? And there aren't studies of that nature yet because it's not far enough along. There are, <clears throat> by the way though, it's growing. Someone did a, just did a UDL research review and they found there's 200 articles, research articles on UDL now, which is really, I mean, where UDL is the thing they're testing, not where it's incidental. There's about a thousand articles that mention UDL. But where UDL is what they're testing, they are, I wish I could say it's fabulous, deep, rich literature. It's not. There's, it's still all early stage. But there are now school districts, not colleges, school districts that have done UDL for three to five years where they actually are showing, this is the heart, of, actually this is, a, this is a powerful question. What would we measure to show that it's effective? And in the US, it all comes down to they have gotta do better on the standardized test. And so you think, wow, is that the outcome measure that is the sign of our culture's advance? But right now we're stuck with it. If we don't show that they do better on the tests, then teachers are like frightened, like, but that's what I'm gonna be judged on is the test. So we're anti-test, to be honest, because it's not a good, by the way, testing, for the reasons, in fact, I just highlighted that. The best predictors of how well you do on a, I just wanna find a way to say this fast. The best thing to think about standardized tests is that it's a measure of your culture. What did you grow up in? That's what it is really measuring. It's a measure of your environment not you when you take those standardized tests. And I have a whole talk I like to give about. They've discovered that, you know what? If you, like on the reading comprehension passage of standardized tests, they found out that kids are highly varied in how they do if they don't read the passage. Don't even give them the passage. Some kids do great. So here, picture this. This is supposed to tell whether your, re your reading comprehension is good. They say, don't read the passage. They eliminate the passage. And then they give the same questions. And some kids do great. <laughs> you know why? Because they've had this culture they've grown up that's been rich. They've been going to special schools. They've been doing all these kind of cool things. And they just guess what would be the right answer from the answers alone. And they do great. So then we see, so I'm sorry, it's too long a digression. That the tests are not an accurate measure of anything. They're really just a measure of your environment, which is not the thing that we can control in schools. So my measures would have much to do more with, I'd want to know, is this person happy in their life? Are they motivated to learn more things? Do they feel good about themselves as learners? We need those measures. That's what I want to point to. Because then everything else will be learnable later. Getting a high score on a uh, test that is an inaccurate predictor of anything, by the way, don't get me started, but what do standardized test scores predict? Do they predict success in life? No. I mean, you know this, right? They don't predict anything. They only predict how you'll do on future tests. They are good at predicting how you're going to do on future tests. They don't even predict how well you'll do in college. But that's the hallmark. It's just terrible. So we've got to get rid of those, and we've got to get good measures. And that's what I would want to measure UDL on, is do we make citizens that are happier, that are eager learners, that feel good about themselves as learners, and that have good careers and all that, we got to get to those measures. I, I went on too long. I won't answer the next question that long. I apologize. Um, is that on? Yes. Uh, David, I want to thank you, because I had a light bulb moment halfway through yours. I, I thank came... God. Pardon? Thank God, I'm glad, because I flew 6,000 miles to get here. <laughs> you did. You did. There were 6,000, for me, miles well spent. Um, I, I came here thinking UDL was designed for disabilities. And actually, partway through that, I realized, actually, we've got students, uh, I teach a technical subject, and some students just don't get it. They don't get the technical subject at all. So actually, what we're doing is, is UDL applies to students that actually just don't get any technical domain. And for me, that's a complete eye-opener. So thank you very much for that. Wow. Cool. Interesting. I mean, I think 
a lot of things are going to change. Remember, the economy that our schools are presented for now are, can we get knowledge into kids' heads? And that's, everybody can Google everything now. We don't need that anymore. So what our school is going to really teach is going to be the two other things. How are kids going to operate and express what they know? And how are kids going to be motivated to know more? Those are going to be the critical things we have to teach. Sounds like you want to say something else. Go ahead. Yeah, can I come back on that? Um, in fact, in our, in our first year, we've redesigned one of the modules, uh, recognizing the fact that actually the answers are out there. What's important is the question. That's right. So we now teach curiosity-based learning in our first year. Way better. And it's a much better predictor. If uh, kids are going to ask good questions is a much better predictor <coughs> of how they will do in life ahead than kids are going to answer <laughs> good questions. Yep, yeah. yeah. agreed. Um, okay, and... Uh, Oh, I'm off the screen. Okay, sorry. I had a, uh, let me just highlight something you could watch on your own then, because it's gorgeous, because uh, it came from last night. Um, have, have anybody seen this? This is a. Um, this is from Glee. That's why I stuck the Glee thing in there. The, the TV show Glee, and Glee is uh, the Glee Club of the singers, and they are all atypical. Well, that's what's cool about the show is that they are not perfect kids. These are not the socius. They all have something wrong, like normal people. Anyway, a deaf choir comes to the school, and the socias, the high mighty kind of students, like, why would you have a deaf choir? What are they going to do, honk? That's literally said on the show. You know, and it's like they're insulting. But the glee club are kids who are used to much more variability and, uh, what's the word, being welcoming. So this wonderful final thing of a show is the deaf choir then joined by the glee club in singing John Lennon's Imagine. And all that beauty we saw last night, what you see is the deaf kids and the non-deaf kids watching each other and learning how to sing in multiple ways. So anyway, I recommend Glee, uh, whatever. I can also turn it on the, during your lunch period. But anyway, thank you very much for all of your attention. <laughs>